I've been doing these short uh, video uh, clips looking at great theological moments in scripture. And we worked our way up to now Christology. We looked at the eternality of the Lord Jesus Christ and his divine attributes. Now I would like to move on to the virgin birth of our Lord uh, in the incarnation, followed then by his humanity along with his divinity. In terms of the virgin birth, going back to the Hebrew scriptures, in Isaiah 7, 14, <clears throat> we see the prediction. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. <clears throat> that text has a double fulfillment, looking at a near son who is a symbol of uh, God being with the people during the time of Ahaz, uh, but it has its final and ultimate fulfillment in the miraculous biological miracle of the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's clear because in Matthew, we see it as a fulfillment of the prophecy pointing to that miraculous miracle in the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 1, for example, Matthew says in verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is with us God, or God with us. We also see the same in Luke 1, verse 35 where the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary with these words, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born in you shall be called the Son of God. So Joseph is instructed to take Mary, uh, the child that Isaiah predicted, because as his wife, because the birth with the birth was a supernatural miracle produced by the Holy Spirit. So we see the prediction in the Hebrew scriptures of its fulfillment, and we see its ultimate fulfillment in the New Testament in these great passages. We also see his incarnation. So we see a biological miracle in the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. And by the way, Hinehal Alma Hara, behold the virgin shall conceive. The word Alma is used, a virgin, that Hebrew word in Genesis chapter 24. So it is used that way clearly in the Hebrew scriptures. But then we move on to the incarnation. This is anticipated in the glory filling the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. We're told in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 38, that the glory of God entered into the tent of meeting and took its residence there. For example, in verse 34, we're told, that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And so as we look back into that great text and then look forward into the New Testament, uh, John tells us that the Lord pup tented among us or pitched his tent among us when he became flesh. Jesus Christ, John tells us in John 1.14, is the glory of God. And we have witnessed the glory of him who is the Messiah. And he truly pitched his tent among us. He truly dwelt among us. The Greek there is a skenosin uh, from skenao, and it's related to the Hebrew uh, verb shachan, to dwell. And so here we have the dwelling 
of Jesus in the second person of the Blessed Trinity taking his abode among the people of God, among the church. And John says, we gazed upon his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. <laughs> we saw the divinity of Jesus in a previous video, and now we also see his full humanity, fully God and also perfect, fully man. We're told a child was to be born. This points to Christ's humanity. And this is in fulfillment of the great covenant that David had been uh, told about. And we see it in Isaiah 9, 1 to 7, where he would be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, El Gibor. It's interesting that that Hebrew phrase is used in Isaiah 10, 21 of God himself, everlasting father and prince of peace. And we're also told that of his government, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with, judge, with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. And this is the promise of the incarnation of Jesus Christ in his perfect humanity, along with his deity, to fulfill the Davidic covenant. And he fully fulfills it. He is fully human and fully divine, not mixed, but in one, what we would call theanthropic person, God, man, person. He clearly was fully human, and yet without sin. For example, he grew in wisdom and stature. Jesus, we're told, uh, found favor with God and man, and he grew in wisdom. We're told that in Luke 2:52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. <clears throat> Furthermore, he was born of a woman, through the supernatural virgin birth, we're told in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, that when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. So he was clearly born at a human birth, and he experienced human, uh, the particulars of being human. Uh, he experienced physical fatigue. He wept, he had thirst, and we're told was fully human. For example, in John 4, verse 6, at Jacob's well, we're told that Jesus, being wearied with his journey, sat on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. <clears throat> we're told he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. In John 11:35, the shortest verse in the New Testament, Jesus wept. We're told that he became thirsty. In John 19, verse 28, we're, we're told that Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, when he was on the cross, said, I thirst. And while he experienced temptations, he was without sin. He was tempted in every way, so he understands our human temptation and is able to identify us, but without sin. We find this, for example, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, where we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So we see the sinless humanity of Jesus Christ and his full deity, both in the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat>